Welcome home, brave heroes. I'm Ash, this is Ash Quest, and it's finally time for me to get around to unveiling and sharing Hero Quest, Jungles of Delthrak, the quest pack that was unveiled pretty much in its entirety and covered by anybody who had a camera or a phone at the UK Games Expo on Friday. In the dense jungle surrounding the mountains at World's Edge, an ancient dwarven civilization finds new roots. A sacred artifact prized by the dwarven refugees of Keller's Keep has been stolen and a dread affliction racks the land. Crystalline growths have developed on the fauna of the jungle, and the creatures have gone into a frenzy. Venture into the perilous jungle lands to uproot the curse that has befallen the region. Vanquish evil, make bold choices, and follow your path to unique endings through an unprecedented choose-your-adventure mechanic. Discover what vile secret looms beneath the canopy before all is lost. There is a lot to take in with this expansion. There is a lot going on. It is another unique expansion created by Avalon Hill from the ground up and given to HeroQuest fans, new and old, young, young and veteran. And a very kind photographer gave me some exclusive pictures to look at. So let us deeply dive. This won't be so much a deep dive. There's, there's not a whole lot now to speculate over. There's just presentation, presentation. There's just explanation. There's just learning at this point. So really, it's not going to be a deep dive so much as it's going to be a very shallow wade in a very, very big wide pool. So please join me. And for anybody curious, I am not going to be looking into the quest book at all. I will be looking at the mechanics that are in the beginning of the quest book and in the, some of the notes at the very end, some of the rules, but I will not be looking at any of the actual quests. So this will be a spoiler-free experience in terms of quests content. So thank you. These pictures are on Amazon. I've got a few more pictures we can look at on other sites as well, and we will. However, importantly, you can pre-order this now. It's on Amazon. It's on Pulse. It's on Big Bad Toy Store. It's pretty much everywhere at any not so local, but still friendly game store. Now their reveal and all of the contents that they're showing is pretty thorough. We get a lot of the alchemy system, which thankfully has made a return here for this new original expansion. We get additions to the currently existing alchemical potions and whatnot that we have in Hero Quest, as well as Rise of the Dreadmoon, and we have new reagents and new potions. And this is the way that I knew they were going to do this. They were going to make it so that the reagent and alchemy system was confined to the expansion in which it was presented. You can use this now because of this with the Rise of the Dreadmoon alchemy deck, or you can use it completely separate. You can use these cards with your own homebrew for your own campaign, any other campaign or scenario in Hero Quest, or you can use the Rise of the Dreadmoon, or you can use a combination. This doesn't expand Rise of the Dreadmoon directly. It is its own alchemy system, but you could combine them. We've got some really cool new dread spells. We have some new treasure cards, this time introducing new hazards like the giant centipede. And of course, we were going to have new artifacts. We have a rogues gallery of monsters with this one, a bunch of monsters, a return of the goblin archers and skeleton archers, which is really cool because that means we now have more of those. And I honestly do not mind them repeating sculpts and including them in different expansions because I feel like the skeleton archers and goblin archers really do fit the theme of what this is all about. I didn't mind having the archer elves and the warrior elves in with Rise of the Dreadmoon because it was very much elf themed. You needed those supplemental materials, especially if you didn't have Mage of the Mirror. And despite its elven lore ties to Mage of the Mirror, of course you shouldn't be expected to have Mage of the Mirror to play Rise of the Dread Moon. The same goes for here. You shouldn't be expected to have any of the expansions, just the game system, in order to play this from the ground up as soon as you've completed the game system. And because this expansion offers not one, not two, but unprecedented and never done before three difficulty modes, that's right, they've introduced difficulty modes with this expansion, you may even be able to take a fresh party and start them out in the jungles of Delthrak. We get a great look at the two new heroes, and another convention has been broken. They actually offered two different sculpts for the two different heroes and included them with this expansion. So we don't just get the one gender-bent hero. We don't just get a hero pack's worth of heroes, which is two sculpts of one hero type. We're getting two times two. So we've got two explorers, which are obviously dwarves, and we're getting two berserkers, which are obviously humans. 
And it's at this point I'm going to start tallying up my points, the, the things that I won, the things that I called out and uh, got right. And uh, two different classes. I don't, I don't think that was um, not obvious. I think that was because of Avalon Hill's comments about not wanting to replace the dwarf and the barbarian or mess with them, but rather give you considerations for, for heroes that you might use in place of them. I think that was a pretty easy call, but called it. I'll take that point. One is a human. I saw claims that that was also a dwarf. Man, sure, very dwarfish because of how bulky the, the human on the cover is, but this guy has some serious leg length, not a dwarf. I'll take that point as well. These also do not replace the dwarf and the barbarian. They have different stats. They have different traits, and that's another point. Yes, you'll notice the Explorer actually does not have the base game dwarf stats. They've got an attack and defend dice of 2 and 2, but their body and mind points are 5 and 5, and they start with the Hand Axe. And thanks to uh, the unique quests and mechanics of Jungles of Delthrak, it may be quite necessary to utilize that defining feature of the Hand Axe that the Short Sword does not have, namely the ability to throw it. I mean, you won't get it back. I, I don't recommend doing that. Um, it's a terrible idea, but you may find yourself faced with the impossible choice of having to do so. And the Berserker. I'm so happy that they have a Berserker class, a Berserker hero. They use a broadsword. They have three attack dice and two defend dice, only seven body points and two mind points. So the Barbarian still has an extra body point on them. I probably would have lowered the body points by just one more if I were going to seriously claim that this doesn't replace the Barbarian. There's going to be a lot of people, a lot of people who use the Berserker instead of the Barbarian in their game now. I can see this. And the Explorer, well, I don't know. I don't know. That's a bit of a deficit in body points there starting out, so maybe. But I think the skills really outweigh the cons for both of these heroes if you're going to be using them in your game instead of the base game Dwarf and Barbarian. So it's finally at this point, finally, that I kind of feel bad for those two heroes. But moving on, onward. Uh, we have a ton of beautiful sculpts and we have a lot of pictures out there. Uh, we have a video on YouTube that has absolutely just crushed this unboxing and unveiling from Happy Fridays. Everybody has seen it by now, but if you haven't, you owe it to yourself to just stop watching this and go watch that. But uh, in another groundbreaking, president-crushing, and convention-abolishing move, Avalon Hill have given us not only these four heroes, they could have stopped. They could have stopped at two heroes and an animal companion, and I think everybody would have been fine. They would have been like, yeah, that's to be expected. That's exactly what I thought they'd put in there. That's continuing the tradition of Against the Ogre Horde. Long live Avalon Hill. They're doing great. 10 out of 10. No, no. They gave us four hero sculpts and two animal companions. Two animal companions. So your very next game of Hero Quest, if it's going to be played in Jungles of Delthrak, could look very, very, very different than what you're doing now because you could be replacing two of the heroes you have and you could bring in your animal companions. I'm sure that they'll have the rulings in there for use of the animal companions and how they should be used if you have fewer than four heroes. It's some kind of nonsense because if you're playing with fewer than four heroes, you should just be playing with four heroes. I mean, if you're playing with fewer than five players, one of the players should take up additional heroes. I mean, you're not saving any time or energy. You're bringing in an animal companion. Why not play two heroes instead of a hero and an animal companion? But it is still pretty cool to have animal companions. I'm not going to besmirch the awesomeness that is having animal companions. Solo quests, for example, an animal companion would come in very, very handy. The homebrew potential is probably really the main reason why these guys are here. You now have more druid forms. That's the number one question everybody has been asking whenever they put an animal in a red plastic. Is this a new form for the druid? No, it's not a new form for the druid per the book, but you can do that. You can absolutely have now several new forms for your druid. Druid can transform into a raptor. Your druid can transform into a saber-toothed tiger. A really fluffy guy right here. He looks awesome. Your druid can transform into a treasure-hunting dwarf or a berserker-looking barbarian man or lady. We see that the explorer has skills and the berserker also has skills, and we'll get a closer look at those here in just a moment. But I just wanted to pick through one more time here all of the sculpts we have. We don't have a lot of furniture tiles with this one. We have what looks like just a whole cache of treasure, just a ton of treasure. This is what the uh, explorer and berserker are after on the cover of the box. This is the giant cache of 
priceless gems, coins, and artifacts. And I'm sure that this will have a mechanic tied to it and not just be a piece of furniture. It'll be something like draw five treasure cards from the top of the deck and discard all the bad ones and just keep drawing till you have five treasures and then that's what you have. And then we've got this awesome elderly man statue on a plinth that will go quite well with our two statues from Rise of the Dread Moon. This is a really cool looking statue, by the way. This guy's holding a bowl. He's got a skull at his feet. Looks like some sort of mage or sage. He's of an age. He's not full of rage. And he's on a board, not a cage. I'm glad that we get two of these raptors, and I'm also glad we get one friendly raptor. I am kind of surprised and shocked that we don't have a bunch of the little spiders. We just have this giant spider sculpt, but we do have tokens that represent spawnlings in this one. Spawnlings can be placed on your hero card. They're little creatures that jump onto you, I guess, while you're adventuring. And if you've got any of these on you uh, at the end of your turn that you didn't succeed in getting off of you killing, then you're going to lose body points. You won't be able to even roll defense. So that could be where the tinier versions of this Blight Weaver enemy come into play. And by the way, the Blight theme here in the jungle is, is pretty cool. I like the idea that the Blight is happening and that the enemies here are tied to the Blight. I'm also quite enamored with the Goblin Warlock here. We don't seem to have a card for the Goblin Warlock. I haven't been able to find one just yet. Uh, this could be a, a very unique enemy, uh, the big bad of this story, maybe. And we see that the sculpt is presented as gray, and they, just like our lovely darling halfling warlock, seem to be in the middle of a sort of transformation, or they have part of their body transformed because of a pact that they have made with a greater being. There's a dagger in one hand, and the other hand is sort of transformed into a demonic claw. We get four more cultists, and they have the exact same sculpt as the gray cultists from Rise of the Dread Moon, but they are in green, and they have different stats. And that's okay. That's all right. I'm, o I'm okay with this. It's fine. Same sculpt, but different color. I'm all right with that. It it's actually... It's actually fine. It's a pretty efficient way of doing things. We get a giant snake. We all knew we were going to get a giant snake, and we get a giant ape, and we all knew we were going to get a giant ape because the giant ape and the giant snake are definitely on the cover of the box, and we knew they were going to be huge. I see that the ape is actually really big, like to scale. The size difference between the ape and the berserker and the explorer are pretty much on par with what we've seen illustrated on the box. Snake Snake is a lot smaller than I thought. Snake is, uh, snake could be a lot bigger. I'd be happier with a bigger snake. I'm glad we get a snake. I'm super glad we get an official giant serpent, and he looks awesome. Okay, so I called the spider creature the Blight Weaver. I was thinking about it weaving a web. I still think it should have been called the Blight Weaver, but it's called the Blight Crawler. Four attack dice, four defend dice, three body points, four mind points. It's going to be a very strong enemy. Not so strong that it can't be used multiple times, though. I think we're going to be seeing a lot of this enemy. It has keywords at the bottom of its monster card. Spawn, Agile, and Venomous. These keywords are going to be common to a lot of the monsters that are in this expansion, and they have specific meanings, as you would guess, as to how the monster behaves and what kind of traits it has. So we're getting a lot of stunning new mechanics in this expansion as well that will be ripe for the pickings of the homebrewers. Also in this image, you see a card representing the spawnlings and their tiles and the mechanics that they have. You see that they have zero attack dice, zero defend dice, one body point. They do have movement squares. If a hero ends their turn with a spawnling tile on their card, they take one body point of damage for each spawnling attached to them. The damage cannot be defended against. The monsters are moving on to your heroes, and once they do, you take that tile off the board and you put it on your card. Really cool mechanic, a really creepy stuff here. I don't want little blight crawlers, spiders spawning and crawling on me. I don't want the centipedes, and I don't want the snake. These are three things that I do not want on my person. But if you do run up to one and attack it, it's going to die. There's not going to be any defending. It has no defend dice. It can't attack you. They're just trying to jump on you. It'll die in one hit. Your only risk is uh, missing the attack, which would definitely happen. I'd probably bring my Berserker right up next to one and roll four attack dice because of an advanced weapon that I would have, and they would all miss. Because why wouldn't they? The aptly named Serpent has... 
four attack, three defense, six body points, and three mind points. This is much more of a boss monster for sure. The skull blights are the things that interest me. The skull blights are very curious creatures. They are like swamp thing. They are living trees. They are the ints of this expansion. But if you look at the icon on their monster card, it is a skull with tendrils of vines coming out of the skull. Absolutely terrifying. The eye sockets, the jaws, everything has been completely covered in this thick root. These guys are pretty dangerous. They're kind of like the abominations of the expansion with three attack dice, two defend dice, and two body points, as well as having their own traits unique. I just want to thank Captain Rubbish for sending these pictures to me. It was very kind of them to get me some exclusive photographs and for giving me permission to use them in this video. Thank you, Captain Rubbish. I do appreciate it. Brave hero. The Berserker's Skills. Enrage, Retaliation, and Frenzy. Enrage, as an action, you may lose up to two body points to immediately make an attack. Add additional attack dice equal to the number of body points you lose. So this is pretty cut and dry. You may use it once per quest. If you are your Berserker and you are attacking an enemy and you haven't yet used your action, as an action, you can lose up to two body points to immediately make an attack. So on this turn, you can discard this card for the quest, turn it over, whatever it is that you do with your ability cards, choose how many body points you are losing, one or two, and then take the respective number of attack dice, either one or two, and add it to an attack that you will now commence making on a monster. I've already seen questions out there, what if I only have one or two body points? If I have two BP, do I die? Not necessarily. You can choose to lose one BP. And this is optional. You don't have to lose any BP. You don't have to use this ability. But if you do, I would rule that you can use both of your BP, your last remaining two BP. If this attack kills you, it's an attack that will go all in. It absolutely plays into the Berserker and the stereotypes surrounding the Berserker class. The Berserker has a single-minded tunnel vision of rage, and it is directed at the nearest living thing. And if it means the Berserker's gonna die with this attack, or they're not going down alone. Some of the enemies in this quest pack are so strong that I can see people making valid choices to hurt themselves in order to be able to or hurt their hurt their heroes, let's be clear, uh, have their heroes hurt themselves in order to be able to take down some of the monstrous enemies in this expansion. Retaliation. This skill cannot be used unless you have five or fewer body points. So you have to lose two body points at least first. You may use the skill when you take damage from an adjacent monster. Immediately make an attack against that monster. May be used once per quest. That is pretty cool. I, I wish there was a way to get that one back because you're going to remain with fewer than five body points five or fewer body points for the quest once you're at that level, unless you've got someone on the team, of course, healing you, and unless you have healing potions. But you don't lose anything for using this. You can immediately counterattack a monster. The counterattack is a mechanic that a lot of people have been homebrewing for the Barbarian for a long time. It just makes sense to have it here for the Berserker. So awesome job, Avalon Hill. And yeah, you knew I was going to shill for Avalon Hill. You, you knew I was an Avalon shill when you clicked on this video. Don't be surprised. Don't. Don't get mad at what you knew was going to happen. <laughs> uh, and finally, Frenzy. This is the classic whirlwind. This skill cannot be used unless you have three or fewer body points, though. So don't think you can just go into a room and use Frenzy and be like, that's my opener. We're going to nail this quest. No, this can be done once the Berserker has been significantly damaged, impaired, injured. As an action, you may make a single sweeping attack against all monsters adjacent and diagonal to you, may be used once per quest. It is at this point that I realized during editing that this attack is actually really well balanced because of the low amount of BP your hero is going to have when you decide to run in and charge an entire group of enemies. It is very possible that you can miss the attack or hit but not actually kill all of the enemies around you, putting you in a very risky position for Zargon's turn. Now, the wording on that card could have used just a tiny bit of work. I don't think anybody's going to question the meaning of it at all. But diagonally adjacent is a term. So all the monsters that are diagonal to me at range, I'll make a sweeping attack against all the orthogonally adjacent, but all of the monsters that are diagonal, no matter if they're adjacent or not. I'll be just like a chess bishop. No, of course it means diagonally adjacent. At least that's rules as intended, I'm certain. These are the explorer skills, and man, yeah, I'm sorry, dwarf. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I 
hate to I hate to betray you, but man, I'm eyeballing this explorer. The treasure hunter skill. Whenever you draw a card from the treasure deck that rewards you with gold coins, you find an additional 25 gold coins. This does not get exhausted. This card is persistent. This is a passive skill that this hero has. Danger Sense. Once per turn, when you draw a hazard card from the treasure deck, you may return that card to the bottom of the deck and draw a new card. This character, once per turn, will avoid hazards. Now, there's going to be multiple hazards in the deck, obviously. When you draw a, specifically the, the hazards in this quest, which are explicitly name hazards, and then they have uh, sub-genre, sub-classes of what they are, like Giant Centipede, you'll be able to return that to the bottom of the deck. You are kind of gambling, though. If the hazards have different levels of danger, and there is a more dangerous hazard card underneath that one that you just put away, you may be drawing that one. But still, you're getting through the deck. You're getting rid of hazard cards. You're putting them at the bottom. Never mind that notwithstanding the whole shuffle the entire treasure deck, making the, the bottom, the card going to the bottom of the deck meaningless. Never mind that. It's just really cool to see this. This also does not exhaust. It's every single turn, once per turn, if your hero is searching for treasure in rooms. And Trapsmith. Once per turn, when you move onto a square adjacent to one or more traps, Zargon must alert you. Zargon does not, however, place trap tiles on the board. The traps are still considered concealed and not triggered. This means that your hero can end their movement there, or they can gamble, they can they can move now, going forward or at 90 degree angles, whatever, thinking that maybe the trap that they're adjacent to is to their left rather than ahead of them, or to their right rather than ahead, or ahead of them rather to the left or right. So this gives the hero a lot of consideration to do. It adds an element of strategy to the hero's turn. It gives them something to think about, and it doesn't necessarily help the whole meta game of move into a room, clear out the monsters, search for traps, search for treasure, move on. It actually gives you just a little bit more consideration. I really, 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 really like this one. I love that it does not run out. Zargon will have to be on their toes, making sure they always alert the explorer whenever they are adjacent to a trap. I think that this is a fantastic skill to homebrew and put into like a tome of learning or something to give other heroes. Uh, not to Not to completely take this hero out of the game at all, but it would be really cool to have this ability in Hero Quest in general. That's just a really cool ability. This is probably my favorite ability out of the whole x bag. The sculpts for the Berserkers are great. This female Berserker might be my favorite sculpt for a human in the game. She is beautiful. And look at these locks of white hair that they have. Is it from age? Is it from stress? Is it just a regional thing? Do these berserkers and the people from the world's end edge mountains have white in their hair? Are they all a little bit rogue-ish? The explorers are also awesome. It's awesome to have more dwarf representation in Hero Quest. finally after so long. The dwarf is, after all, the best hero in the game. The best thing about Hero Quest. Now, this is this is a dwarf. It's not the dwarf. So, I don't want to see any debates out there like we did with the rogue heir and the elf. I don't want to see anybody being like, "Well, do these guys start out with the toolkit, and can they do the same dwarf things?" Listen, I had enough of that. Okay, all right. The berserker is not a barbarian. It's a berserker. They're both humans. That doesn't mean that they're they have the same thing going on. The dwarves are dwarves, but they're not the dwarf. I think we've all learned that lesson by now. I think we're all on the same page. Don't let me catch you doing it. Don't let me catch anybody out there making the mistake of not having it. All right, you knew that we couldn't have this expansion without huge outdoor tiles. Call it on this one. We knew we were getting gigantic outdoor tiles for sure. These, uh, of course, are double-sided, very different things on each side, but outside definitely presented here. The Blight Weaver is actually the name of the cultist in this X-Pack. And they're pretty weak. They are pretty, uh, you could you could knock them out pretty, pretty easily with the Berserker or the Barbarian. But uh, one body point, yeah, they're, they're going to hit the floor right away whenever I see one. And that's the strategy that I recommend you follow because each Blight Weaver, of course, may cast each of the following Dread spells once per quest. Channel Dread and Creeping Grasp. Channel Dread sucks. Don't let them cast that. I don't know what Creeping Dread is yet, but don't let them cast that either. I'm sure it does also suck. 
These guys are super weak, so of course they have to have spells that just suck if you let them cast them. And the giant ape with eight movement squares. This guy is Donkey Konging all over the place with four attack dice and three defend dice. He is King Konging all over the place. He has seven body points, five mind points. That's a huge amount of body points. He is agile. Do these grasping vine trap tiles look familiar? They should. Nice to see them coming out in the wild here, no pun intended. If found during a search, Zargon remarks that the square looks suspicious and points to the square where the trap is located without marking it with a tile or other component. Once a grasping vines trap has been discovered, a hero may attempt to jump or disarm the trap. If a hero steps onto the square containing a grasping vines trap, the hero springs and vines lash out to attack them. They must one roll one combat die. On a black or white shield, they successfully dodge the vines and may continue their movement. If they roll a skull, they suffer one body point of damage and are held in place by the vines. Their turn immediately ends. They cannot move from the square until they or another adjacent hero spends an action to destroy the vines. The hero is then freed and the trap is removed from the board. This means you can't destroy these vines beforehand. I hope that there's a mechanic in place that allows us to start doing that a little later in the quest. I know homebrewers are probably going to allow it, but the difficulty's probably been balanced to not allow you to do this by default and just get caught or try to avoid them otherwise. I know there's going to be quests where we have to cut through some vines, though. Venomous Tiles. Place these tiles on the hero card if that hero fails to resist venom from a venomous monster. Cocoon Tiles represent cocoons, concentrations of webbing that may contain treasure or deadly surprises. A hero adjacent to a cocoon can spend an action to destroy it, which removes the obstacle from the board. Cocoons block line of sight and cannot be moved through. Cannot wait to see what kind of dastardly nonsense these tiles are going to pose for us when we destroy one, hoping to find treasure beyond, only to unveil a corridor full of monsters. Spawnling monsters can be encountered throughout the quests. A monster with the spawn ability creates spawnlings of its own type. Gotcha. See more on spawnlings on page 48. We've got the serpent spawnling, the bright crawler spawnling, and the giant centipede spawnling. These tiles represent individuals the heroes may meet in their travels. Strangers with no given statistic flee if attacked by a hero. If they flee, remove the tile from the board. So, NPCs. I love it. Didn't see a giant centipede monster? So, wondering where that comes into play. I know the hazard exists when you draw the card, so maybe that's where this particular spawnling tile comes into play. We continue to keep unthreatened movement, so your heroes can simply move as if each die that they would have rolled is a four when it's their turn to speed up gameplay just a little bit. We still have multi-phase enemies from against the ogre horde. That is awesome. And monsters without mind points cannot have spells cast on them. Rather, spells that target a target's mind points cannot be cast on monsters that have no mind points. So you can't put any of the, these monsters to sleep that have zero mind points. The animal allies are back, of course, we knew that. There's an optional rule here introduced, order of play. A round is the sequence in which heroes take their turns. After each hero player has taken their turn, the round ends. If there are monsters active on the board, the round includes Zargon and ends after Zargon completes their turn. Enter the order of play optional rule. Heroes may decide on the order in which they take their turns in a round. Regardless of player order, Zargon takes their turn only after all heroes have taken their turns. Was pretty sure we were already doing that, but now it's official. Creeping Grasp can ensnare a hero with vines. Something very interesting here in this picture, we have the Spider Step Elixir. Something dark scuttles inside the glass. Best not to think about it. Drink this potion to move unaffected through squares containing revealed pit traps, hindering terrain, furniture, and monsters. This potion's effects ends if you suffer any amount of damage. Spider Step Elixir confirms that by default, furniture is implied to hinder the heroes. Now there's a lot of us that play with furniture on the board and act as though it completely blocks. So you can't step over it. You can't move onto it. You can't pass through it. This is pretty obvious for stuff like bookshelves and fireplaces. They're just not valid spaces to step on. If you can't put a hero on a fireplace, it won't even stand there. It'll just fall right off. But interestingly enough, this pretty much confirms that you can't do that with tables either. It's furniture put right up there with hindering terrain, pit traps, and monsters. I just thought that was interesting. But if you drink Spider Step, you can move through furniture, no problem at all. And I would, of course, include that to mean even fireplaces and the like. You could, if the room was full of orcs and there was a fireplace and then there was a door, if you needed to, you could just move through the fireplace and, and, and right through the door. And I would like to imagine that you're using a short character like a dwarf or the warlock or, or the explorer or the short druids and they're using spider step and they just they just kind of run ninja run up and over the wall or just just spider spider step 
over and go through the other side. It's awesome that it's persistent and it only costs 100 gold coins. There are monsters in the game that can cause paralysis. There are gems in the game that are worth gold coins, but the card description doesn't necessarily say that you get gold coins. So it'll be interesting to see if people interpret this as allowing the explorer to get the additional 25 gold coins when they find these treasures, or if they will disallow it because these aren't technically finding gold coins. I could see it going both ways. Some of the monster notes, which I was really excited to read about, we have Agile. These monsters can move unaffected through squares containing hindering terrain, furniture, and heroes as if they were not there. We have Venomous. If a hero takes damage from a Venomous creature, they become paralyzed. While paralyzed, they are unable to take their movement but may still perform actions. The heroes can end the effect at once by rolling one red die. On a roll result of five or six, they resist the Venom. Otherwise, place a Venom token on that hero's card and the effect ends at the end of their next turn. I love Venomous. I do. I really thought that this was going to be something that sapped the enemy's body points, but body points are such a slim resource in Hero Quest that I thought maybe if they do that, it's really going to be, it have to be expertly crafted and super well play tested because it could be something that really breaks some aspects of the game. Uh, a lot of people have homebrew systems. Shout out to Leorlek, who has crafted something that has several different kinds of status effects that are brought into play through the use of special combat dice. But if you're going to do something like poison, the, the poison status effect, like in classic JRPGs, you have to be very careful about how you implement it in a game like Hero Quest. If we all had like 10 BP or more per hero, then I could see us just, it's sapping away. Like there's other board games, like uh, I believe the Arkham games have such a mechanic where you just steadily lose your health or sanity every single turn because you have this condition and you need to get rid of the condition in order to progress. So you have to effectively handle those conditions or mitigate them or just avoid getting them all together. But again, Hero Quest, we don't have that many BP to play with. We could be one shot by a goblin if we're not careful, if, if we're at low enough health, of course. Clever Tactician. These monsters may move before and after taking an action, so they gave that a name. Clever Tactician. They roll one additional attack die when targeting a hero adjacent or diagonal to another monster. I don't like the, the combination of rules here. That, that's really going to make a monster a pain in the butt if they have Clever Tactician. You're going to have to make sure you're not next to other monsters. <laughs> and spawn. At the end of each hero's turn, each active monster with a spawn ability can do one of the following special actions, like create one new spawnling on an unoccupied square adjacent to the spawning monster if you have the corresponding tile available, so only if you haven't already spawned the, all of the tiles worth of that particular monster type, or take the movement of all active spawnlings of its type. For example, say the heroes are fighting a serpent. At the end of the barbarian's turn, that serpent chooses to create a new spawnling. Place a serpent spawnling tile adjacent to the serpent miniature. The dwarf then takes their turn. At the end of the dwarf's turn, the serpent chooses to move all active spawnlings and is able to move that new spawnling tile onto the square occupied by the elf. The spawnling tile is placed on the elf's hero card. Now at the end of the elf's turn, they will take one body point of damage from that spawnling. And of course, there are notes on ranged enemies and more notes on spawnlings. No risk, probably, of running out of those spawnling tiles, though, because we've got four of each kind at the very least. Yay! Can't wait to have a board full of snakes, spiders, and centipedes. The crystal clusters, the basins, and the fire sculpts are all very interesting as well. It'll be really cool to see how the basins are used, but it's really nice to have this sort of... It's the fountain is what it is, but it's outdoors. And the fire, that's that's interesting. I really thought that this was a, a vine. The crystal cluster is pretty interesting. The stockpile is easily my favorite. The stockpile and the statue are my favorite things here in terms of new furniture, new scenery. It says basin, but it's called also pool of water. The basin by itself represents a pool of water. When you need to place a crystal cluster or bonfire on the board, place the respective crystal miniature and fire miniature on top of the basin. Look ahead to learn more about the different mechanics for pool of water, crystal cluster, and bonfire. Pool of water is represented by the basin alone. Creatures may move through the pool of water, but they may not end their turn occupying the same space as it. If a hero searches for treasure in an area containing a pool of water, they may choose to restore one lost body point instead of drawing from the treasure deck. The pool of water does not block line of sight. Nice. Very nicely done. Crystal cluster is represented by the crystal miniature placed on a basin. These crystals radiate dread energy. If a monster casts channel dread while adjacent to the crystal cluster, 
they add one to their roll result. The channel, oh God, the crystal channel can be attacked. It has body points, it cannot defend. The bonfire is represented by the fire miniature placed on a basin. Creatures may move through the bonfire, but may not in their turn occupying the same space as it. Any creature who moves through the bonfire must roll a combat die. If they roll a skull, they suffer one body point of damage. The bonfire does not block line of sight. And statue. Each statue is a relic heralding dire times. The statue blocks line of sight. Finally, we get a lot of hindering terrain tiles, specifically hindering terrain singular tiles. Unlike other quest packs, the quests in Jungles of Delthrak won't always be played in order. The heroes will find opportunities to make choices between multiple quest paths. As in the Hero Quest game system, rules, the heroes will restore all body and mind points between quests, unless otherwise noted. Of course, sometimes you will start or end your quest using a particular doorway. Because this expansion does not require the ownership of another expansion to play in its entirety, you will see the use of these doors with these arrows, and they don't necessarily represent iron or wood doors because this doesn't come with any iron or wood doors. So this will use your regular doors for once, which I think is fine. Uh, I, I thought the inclusion of the iron and the, the, the wood doors in the classic X-Packs and the reprints, the, the re-releases, remasters, remakes of those X-Packs was silly. I didn't expect Avalon Hill to change it because they should have preserved the sanctity of it. But the original idea of having these two new door types actually serve no other purpose than to mark an entrance and an exit when we could have had awesome new door types like the portcullis from Mage of the Mirror. Yeah, don't mind me. I'm not even salty. It's just something that I wanted to bring up. A group of heroes should not include duplicate hero characters. This is one of the first times I have seen this statement made. I've seen it made in particular about the Barbarian. I've seen it made about the Elf in their respective expansions. I've not seen should not include duplicate hero characters. They're finally going out and saying, yeah, you can't have two rogues or two knights or anything. You, you should not include duplicates. Finally, we have standard heroic and story modes for the difficulty levels. In standard mode, hero death proceeds as written in the Hero Quest game system rulebook. But in heroic mode, heroes do not die when their body points are reduced to zero, but are instead incapacitated. Replace that hero miniature with an equipment tile. At the start of that hero's next turn, they take a skull tile to represent their being on the verge of death. If an incapacitated hero starts their turn with the skull tile in their possession, they die. Another hero can use an action to administer a healing potion to an incapacitated hero if they are on or adjacent to the incapacitated hero's equipment tile, so long as neither hero is adjacent to a monster. Incapacitated heroes can be healed in other manners as normal. When an incapacitated hero receives healing, they are brought back from the verge of death. That hero discards any skull tile they possess. Replace the equipment tile with the hero miniature. If they cannot occupy the square they were incapacitated on, place them as close as possible to that square. I love heroic. It is defining how we can actually use some of the uh, more immediate healing effects instead of letting certain heroes die where they stand on Zargon's turn. Love that. That's a very elegant clarification on how to handle that situation. Spellcasters and death is also clarified here, which is awesome for heroic and story mode only. If a hero spellcaster dies, they can immediately heal themselves by casting an available healing spell, regardless of whether they had previously used an action on their turn. It says available healing spell, so you cannot have already used that healing spell. It would no longer be available if you'd already used it. And that's pretty much it for the reveal of Jungles of Delth. Uh, I can't find more information on story mode at this time, but you know, that's completely okay. I do know it has to be a more forgiving method of play so that if heroes die, I believe they get the uh, incapacitation, but they don't get the skull tile. The Sabertooth Tiger is really cool to see. We were supposed to get a Sabertooth in Sinister Sorcerers, uh, the Lost Wizard expansion pack, which could still come out one of these days. You never know. And... It's really lovely to see the Goblin Warlock. Again, don't see a card for the Goblin Warlock. I think it's going to be a special uh, named that gets its stats directly in the quest in which it's presented, just like uh, the Archmage Sinestra from Mage of the Mirror. Not my favorite way of doing things, but certainly a fine way of doing things because now we have a mage enemy. And I always knew, I called, that at some point we were going to get enemies that represented the spellcaster of that enemy type. We have regular goblins. We have archer goblins. It's only natural that we get a warlock or other type of mage goblin. Although I called shaman or witch doctor which could be construed as culturally insensitive. I knew they weren't going to exactly go that route. Shaman, maybe. 
Druid, Druid Goblin. Anyways, I love seeing everything here. The raptor sculpts are super cool. Some people say dinosaurs don't belong in Hero Quest. I say that fantasy does have a spot for dinosaurs. I don't think that everything needs to have it, but I do think some dinosaur type influence can be in a fantasy setting. And all those either called raptors, there's no reference to the word dinosaur. So this is just the, the version of the raptor that has evolved and has stayed relevant and didn't go extinct. And, and of course, it's got new traits and awesome new features. It is a fantastical looking raptor. And they have a unique talent for opening doors. So I think somebody on the team at Avalon Hill definitely watched Jurassic Park and really liked Chris Pratt. Clever girl. And that's about it. If you want more Hero Quest content, go watch another one of my videos. I have tons of them. You can check out Always Bored, Never Boring, as well as the Dungeon Dive. They have great content on Hero Quest as well. I appreciate you all so much for your kind attention, and you can be sure that I will do a full and detailed unboxing of this whenever it is in my possession at last. We'll be doing comparisons. We'll be doing glamour shots. We'll be doing playthroughs. All of that stuff. What are your thoughts on the jungles of Delthrak? I know not everybody is as happy and as excited about every single point on this as I am, but I absolutely welcome and understand, tolerate, and accept all criticism, even to the contrary of things that I like. What are your thoughts on this expansion? What little things would you have replaced or removed? What did you hope to see and they didn't fulfill your wish? We'll also get to some expectations of mine that I'm not sure were fulfilled with this expansion. Just very, very, very minor, tiny, small gripes that could be used for an upcoming product. But that's another time, brave heroes. Until then, have a great rest of your day. And now, onward.